happy to say we've put a work group together to address that last step right there uh, at our safety conference. That's the way we roll, collaboration. We're all about it. For the next group I want to uh, bring up, after the Chicago fire in 2014, it was determined that a full-time director would be uh, created to address contingency operations in the NAS. That resulted in the formation of AJRX Contingency Operations, which was tasked with ensuring that each major facility has an operational contingency plan and that it would be viable given the current resources that we have in the FAA. Two of the members of that group are here today to discuss contingency operations. So please welcome uh, Trey Madrid, Contingency Operations Staff Specialist, and Jason Greider, Contingency Operations NACA Representative. Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for having us today. Um, as he said, we are from AJRX, Contingency Operations, uh, Operational Readiness. And uh, what we're here to talk about today is contingency operations in the NAS. Um, my name is Trey Madrid, and I've been a 2152 for a little over 27 years now. I worked at Albuquerque Center. Uh, I worked in the traffic management unit as well as two of the specialties there. And then I went to uh, the command center where I worked in severe weather for a couple of years. I spent uh, four and a half years after that at Oakland Center as a radar and an oceanic controller. And for the last 18 months, I've been with uh, AJRX, uh, which started as ATOC uh, at the command center doing contingency operations. My partner here is uh, Jason Greider, and he's our Article 114 rep. Jason Greider out of uh, Fort Worth Center. I've been there for about 18 years now. Been uh, the Article 114 rep for contingency operations for about two years now. Um, and if you can go ahead and play the video. A potentially dangerous situation for Memphis firefighters this morning. Live for us on the scene near Memphis International. A chemical spill. A simple error. A Friday morning travel nightmare. 450 flights canceled as of 9 o'clock Eastern Time. A fire at an air traffic control facility. Power failure in the air traffic control tower in Miami this morning. With big consequences. Anybody on uh, this frequency? Can you hear Miami approach? Now it's all interconnected. Thousands of travelers stuck in long lines. Okay, everybody on this frequency is extreme caution. We've lost all communication. We've lost all radars. We cannot see you. Stop departures. We lost our radar. RJ. All aircraft maintain present heading and present alpha. When a crisis occurs, they are totally unreadable. Red on alpha and short of what? American one. Hold on gate. Ten three sixty two push. Negative. It's too late for planning. We just lost everything. Just uh, maintain eight thousand for now. Continue on the arrival. Solve eight one counter approach at ten six. And we're expecting even more cancellations as they get this wrapped up. We're told that the FAA has not really been able to get back into that telecommunications area to figure out whether anything was damaged and whether or not they can bring that center back up. We need to be prepared. Anticipating risks. So as you can see, what uh, we're here to talk about is catastrophic events. Uh, when they talk about contingency, they talk about crisis and catastrophe. Um, the FAA does have plans how to work traffic when we have a contingency event. Uh, the plans are owned by each facility. So each facility owns their own OCP, Operational Contingency Plan, and they decide the best way to move traffic again once an ATC Zero event occurs. Our job is to enable and empower more efficient NAS services during catastrophic events. So we come together and we look at what are the issues that facilities have, how, how can they do air traffic and not be in their facility. And so the, the OCPs work to have traffic restarted 
by neighboring facilities. So we look at that for each individual facility in the NAS. We look at it for the towers. We look at it for the tracons. We look at it for the up-downs. Uh, we look at it for the centers. And we even look at it for the oceanic airspace. How do we start traffic moving again once an ATC zero event has occurred? Because the people in that facility may not be in that facility anymore. With an ATC zero event, um, like what happened at Washington Center that we saw in the video, the people there were evacuated. The building was empty, but the planes didn't go away. So we look at how we can continue to run traffic and what means we can use to keep traffic moving in the NAS. Yeah, so contingency plans are nothing new to controllers or the agency, but after the Chicago fire and after some of these other high-level events, the agency decided really to focus in and put together a directorate that's going to focus in strictly on helping facilities build OCPs so that in the event of an ATC zero, um, we know what to do. Um, as controllers, we're more than willing and able to get out there and work the traffic. Just give us the tools and we'll go with it. So that's where we're at now. So like Paul said earlier to, today, um, things happen in the NAS and we as an agency need to do a better job of quickly reacting to, those, to the needs of the flying public. We know that we have the, mo the most professional people on the job at all times. I'm so proud to be a NATCA member and to know what our people can do at the drop of a hat. Uh, when, when the event happened at Chicago and that fire took place, every controller leaned in and they did everything that they could to restart traffic moving, to bring the NAS back up to where it should be. What, we, what we're trying to do is not wait for that next event to happen, but to actually plan ahead and have a system in place where when an event like that happens, we know what to do and it's not reactionary. It's a planned event that we can go ahead and start moving traffic right away um, and get the NAS back up to where it should be. So we go out to the facilities and uh, we work with each individual facility to improve their OCP. We talk to the facility about how it is best to run traffic on a, on a limited basis from there. But then we go to the support facilities and we ask them what they can do to help. And we put facilities together talking. We try to communicate. We try to collaborate and get together and really find out what a TRACON can do working with a center that they're not used to working with to start traffic moving again. And so we work with each facility and their neighboring facilities and the facilities that underlie them to build a strong plan that can be executed and something that can be trained so that every controller knows if my neighbor's facility goes down, what's my role? What's my responsibility? So we try to really bring it all together and have an incremental approach. So if it's a short outage that, that maybe lasts an hour or two, we have a plan for that. But if it's an event like Chicago, Chicago was 18 days. How are we going to run traffic for 18 days without being at Chicago Center? So we look at phasing in more traffic and more services as the event grows longer and longer. So as we're going out to these facilities and, and trying to sell to controllers that, guess what, if your neighbor goes down, you're going to need to work their airspace. You tell any controller you're going to work airspace that you've never been trained on or certified on, they're going to say no. So immediately, the subject of training came up. Um, you know, like I said, I started on this about two years ago. About six months ago, we put together a training work group, and uh, just two weeks ago, we were able to finish up with the work group and develop training requirements uh, that will be sent up through AJI to develop training for controllers. Um, it's a very difficult task trying to figure out how much training familiarization. We know that there's no way that you can learn a neighbor's airspace and stay current on it or be certified on it. But what level of training do you need to be able to work one or two airplanes through that airspace and slowly build up more traffic, more efficiency? So that's where we're at on that. Um, 
You can also thank me later for the uh, extra Elms course that you'll be having every year. So there's that. So something that we've found is working together improves safety. We know that. It's part of our culture now. We put the right people in the right room together. We get things done. We, I know controller needs. That's, that's where I came from. But controllers can't do this by themselves. So we have to leverage tech ops and what they know. We have to leverage the FAST and the OSF at the facilities to find out what automation changes that they can make. How can we change the software to handle traffic during a contingency event? So it's really a three-legged stool that we're building. And we try to get all three pieces together and talking so that we can have a plan that is executable in an emergency. Um, part of what we do also is we go out and we talk to facilities and we work with them to improve their plan, to look for shortfalls and gaps and fill in those shortfalls and gaps. Um, that's, that's one piece of the puzzle. What we do after that is we come back and we have this uh, evaluation and exercise procedure that we do. So we have people sit back and review the plan and once again go through it in a, in a sterile environment to look at it and say, okay, what gaps are, do we find? What shortfalls can we see that we can go back and fix? So we, we run these plans, we run exercises and reviews, and go back and try to find every shortfall that we can, and then go back and revisit that plan and improve it. So this is not a one and done by any means. We're gonna come out to your facility, we're going to, we're going to talk to you, we're, gonna, we're going to help you get the right people together in the room to make a plan that works. It may be kind of a rudimentary plan at first because we're very new in this. I've been doing it about 18 months. Jason is the senior member on the team. He's got about two years. So we're learning every day as well. But we're coming back, we're, we're making a plan, and then we're, we're checking it, and then we're going back and improving it again. So this is more of a life cycle approach than has ever been taken for contingency before. Um, I think if we look back in the past, a lot of the contingency plans came about in a quick two-week period where the administrator said, we need to have a contingency plan. And the facility said, okay, what does that mean? They had to put a plan together and get it submitted very quickly. So things were missed anytime you hurry. So we try to slow that process down, get the right people in the room, improve those plans, and then go back and, and test them. So we test for realism, we test for fidelity, we test for contingency um, and consistency. We wanna make sure that each facility, even though they have their own needs, that across all of the centers, that there's some consistency there in the plans. So we've got a couple questions up here. Um, Got one up here. It says, how can uh, Western Artsies, with few underlying tracons for radar support stated, for radar support, uh, stated efficiency goals uh, during a catastrophic event? Um, we're, we're definitely looking at these challenges because, you know, in the Chicago event, uh, truthfully, it couldn't have happened at a better place because they do have underlying tracons. Um, immediately, you can start moving traffic through those tracons. You get out to Denver and Albuquerque and Fort Worth. You just don't have as many options that way. So what we're having to look at is how can we utilize neighboring centers to be able to take over that airspace? And I'll add, I'll add a little bit to that question since I'm from Western Centers. Um, it is definitely a challenge when you don't have TRACONs underlying. But we have found, and I think if you're a center controller, you know that you take an early handoff and you get that airplane shipped from your neighbor and you're able to talk to them in their airspace, well, maybe we can leverage that space where the neighbor can talk to another facility, use the radar coverage that's out there. We use a tool called RamView to look at what radar coverage we have between facilities. So we, we sit down and we look at Oakland Center. Well, we look at what Seattle Center can see inside their airspace. And then we try to find out how far their radios can talk inside that airspace. Because very quickly, if we know that that airspace is stable and we know the traffic that's in it, 
we can start helping airplanes through that airspace using resources that are already at the neighbor. And then later, we'll go back and we'll change the adaptation and the software to have radar coverage and new frequencies brought into the neighboring facility and we can do a more robust job of taking traffic into that airspace. So we do, we do look at Western centers a little bit differently than we look at Eastern centers. But as we get more and more people together and, and we have these discussions, we're finding more ways where we can run traffic um, without having to have that, that the TRACON coverage down below. So the top question up here, I can answer that one really uh, quickly. Careful what you ask for, it's coming. You will have some training every year. Um, looking at recurrent training now, so here it comes. That's simple enough. Um, go with the one, maybe the one. I can grab that third one down there. Yeah. When will these plans be in place? Well, I will tell you that um, we had a visit to Miami Center. Uh, when we went to Miami Center, we also went to the TRACON and we went to Jacksonville Center. Uh, and then we had uh, telcons with every TRACON that lies below uh, Miami Center. So we worked on the Miami Center plan to try and um, make that plan solid to make sure every facility knew what their role would be in contingency. And we went through and uh, they're in the process right now of management and NAPCA getting together and negotiating that plan to make sure that we didn't miss anything. So again, an, another one of those checks and balances that we use, but they're in the process of negotiating that plan. And uh, once that is done, we'll be able to brief that plan to the, to the controllers that will be involved in that. Uh, right now, we've got folks that are doing the same thing for Oakland Center. So it's coming. Um, I think what we have right now is a plan over the next three years to try to visit all of the major facilities. Um, the smaller towers, uh, if they go home on the mid, that might be the contingency plan because um, we have days where due to weather or some other unforeseen circumstance, no controllers can get to the tower. We go ahead and still run operations just as though it was on the mid. So we either do it from the overlying trachon or we do it from the center. Where, where we start running into difficulties and need a more robust plan is when we get to a, a large facility. So a large trachon, a large tower um, that does not, that runs 24 hour operations or at a center. But we're coming. Yeah. And uh, sometime over the next three years, you'll probably see us in your building. Absolutely. And I know we're out of time here, but one more quick question that's not up there anymore. But uh, there was a question about the Tech Center and the Spare RC, BCP. Um, for your information, those, both of those have been tested, the ATOP side and the ERAM side. Um, I was there. They're very functional. It takes about 21 days to get it stood up. The command decision would be if, uh, if a facility is going to be out for more than six months, the decision would be made to fire up that tech, the Tech Center. So thank you very much, uh, and you all have a great event. Thank you all.